My name is Richard Wright, and I'm Editor-in-Chief of the BJS. On behalf of the entire editorial team, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the annual BJS lecture and to the first ever awarding of the biennial BJS prize. BJS editor Fran Tonkas is going to chair tonight's lecture, but before I turn the floor over to her to introduce tonight's speaker and respondent, it's my honor first to award the inaugural BJS prize to Claire Saunders for her article, Double-Edged Swords, Collective Identity and Solidarity in the Environment Movement, which appeared in the two, June 2008 issue of the BJS. The BJS Prize was established to recognize an article published in the BJS during the pre previous 24 months that in the opinion of the editors and the editorial board makes an outstanding contribution to increasing sociological knowledge. Claire Saunders' article certainly does that. Not only does it challenge our thinking about the concept of collective identity, it also serves as a practical caution against the easy assumption that collective identity necessarily functions to bind social movements, which often are comprised of groups with differing collective identities, as certainly appears to be the case with the UK environmental movement. Probably the highest praise I can give Double-Edged Swords is that this job requires me to do a lot of reading. And not all that reading is a joy. But I genuinely enjoyed reading this article, and I learned a great deal from doing so. Of course, others will win the BJS Prize in the future, but there will only ever be one inaugural winner, Claire Saunders. <laughs> it's a pleasure to recognize her here publicly tonight. Claire, come up. There was also only one second winner, and only one third winner. <laughs> And now, with great anticipation, I'd like to introduce Fran Tonkas, who in turn will introduce tonight's featured speaker and respondent. Hang on, it promises to be a very stimulating evening. Fran. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight to the 2009 BJS public lecture. I am, as Richard has mentioned, Fran Tonkis, an editor of the British Journal of Sociology and a member of the Department of Sociology here at the LSE. It's my particular pleasure to welcome this evening Professor Loïc Lacanf to give the BJS Lecture 2009, and also Professor Nicola Lacey, who will uh, be in the role of respondent this evening. Uh, just before I move on to introduce the speakers, I should uh, introduce also some housekeeping business uh, around the arrangements for the lecture. Professor Vacon will speak first of all, and then Professor Lacey will respond. We will have some time for questions from the floor. And I should also point out that tonight's event is being recorded, and we hope we will be able to make the recording available online uh, for you and for others who weren't able to make it this evening. Um, and importantly, we have drinks to be served after the lecture, and uh, more information on those directly. Firstly, let me introduce our guest speaker. Loïc Vacan is Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Berkeley, and at the Centre de Sociologie Européenne in Paris. As these affiliations will suggest, he is a truly international figure in his field, and one whose work speaks to a number of critical concerns in the discipline today, to issues of urban marginality and poverty, race and class, the sociology of the body, the critical uses of ethnography and of social theory, and his themes tonight, not least, the government of insecurity and the nature and practices of the penal state. He is author or editor of over a dozen books and countless articles, including uh, in the, the books most recently, 2007's Urban Outcasts, A Comparative Sociology of Advanced Marginality, and this year's Punishing the Poor, the Neoliberal Government of Insecurity. He is very well known uh, from the, the early years of his career as the co-author with Pierre Bourdieu of An Invitation to Reflexive Sociology. And in that connection, I'd recommend to you an interview published with Loïc Vacan in the journal Qualitative Sociology in 2008, where he reflects on his sociological awakening 
um, as well as his sociological concerns today. And he will permit me, he recounts in this interview how one evening in the late 1980s, a friend took or dragged him to a public lecture, sorry, in late 1980, going back a little further, a friend uh, took him to a public lecture given by Bourdieu on the theme, The Questions of Politics. And he recounts, this was a, a true revelation. As Vicomte relates it, I did not understand three quarters of what Bourdieu said, which I'm sure will be a comfort to many of my own undergraduates, but I certainly grasped that something very important was being said and that I had to dig to the bottom of it. When I got home after that lecture, in the wee hours of the morning, I said to myself, if that's sociology, that's what I want to do. It's no exaggeration, I think, to say that Loïc Vacant's own work has had a similar impact in inspiring students and other readers to think about the critical value of sociology as a discipline and as a practice. And it's work, too, that engages debates and thinkers beyond disciplinary boundaries. And in that context, um, it's a pleasure tonight to introduce Professor, Nicholas, uh, Professor Nicola Lacey, who is Professor of Criminal Law and Legal Theory here at the London School of Economics. Uh, her particular research interests uh, most recently are on the historical development of ideas of criminal responsibility and also the politicization of contemporary criminal justice policy. I'd invite you now to welcome both of our speakers and first of all, Loïc Lacan. <laughs> I would like first to, <laughs> to laugh. <laughs> and then second, I would like to thank the British Journal of Sociology for inviting me to deliver this lecture and the LSE for hosting it in this wonderful theater whose Byzantine name attests to the continuing dependency on advanced capitalist economies on, upon oil producing dynasties. <laughs> I would like to thank you, the audience, for uh, coming to participate in this event. Lecturing is a performance arts, and the speaker always needs an eager and atten an attentive public to uh, uh, fulfill his duties. <laughs> and I would like to thank Nicola Lacey for agreeing to be my intellectual sparring partner uh, for the evening. Uh, under duress, since she only got uh, the skeleton of a paper, but then that created duress for me <laughs> in return because once I had given her a six-page, very detailed analytic outline, I was sort of stuck and I had to write the paper that I had given an outline for. And so basically it led me to write about three papers mashed into one, so it's going to create difficulties in presenting it, so I'm going to have to uh, uh, skip over some parts and then summarize parts of the argument. I would like to uh, dedicate this lecture to Stanley Cohen, uh, not only for his classic account of the battles between the mods and rockers on the beach of Brighton in the 1960s, which filled in the social backdrop of my favorite rock band, uh, but for his majestic body of work on the modalities and quandaries of social control. His writings on the topic, from against criminology to visions of social control to states of denial, are for me, and I surmise for many others in this theater, an endless fount of analytic stimulation and a dare to the sociological imagination. Um, I don't know what he will think of my talk tonight, but in the spirit of his oeuvre, it will definitely go against criminology and it will offer a vision of social control that aims to dent the denial of the significance of the penal state by social science. Uh, now, on the occasion of a, of a name lecture such as this one, one faces an alternative between presenting work that is completed, done, packaged, well, uh, uh, easy to expose and to defend or to try to push forth and venture onto new terrain. I've chosen the second option, which means that the presentation is going to be a little coarser that you might have a right to expect. Um, it's also more risky since my arguments are, are not fully elaborated conceptually and documented empirically, but I think the cognitive payoff uh, is potentially greater and it should make for a more fun evening for you, if not for me. Um, I want to use this lecture basically to put the penal state, and by penal state I mean the police, the courts, the prisons, and their extensions entrusted with the lawful enforcement of the socio-moral order. I want to put the penal state squarely on the agenda of sociology. And by that I mean not the sociology of crime, deviance, and punishment, but the sociology of the state, 
of neoliberalism, the study of inequality, marginality, and citizenship at millennium's dawn. And so I'm going to get us started, bring the uh, penal state back in. Now, I'm not going to have the time to make, go methodically through all the steps in my argument, but I'm going to give you a sort of a compressed sketch um, at the outset so that if I have to speed up and jump over certain parts, then you don't get totally lost. That's also the function of the, the PowerPoint presentation, which I should add is only my second PowerPoint presentation ever. <laughs> the first one went well, it was for the Lewis Coser uh, lecture at the ASA, but I'm courting disaster by doing the second one for another important <laughs> event. I should have gotten some practice in between, but I didn't. I'm going to argue that first we live in the third age of, con of the Great Confinement, after the 1600s and the 1800s, the beginning of the 21st century, um, belying the prophecies made from, from 1945 to 75, that the prison was a doomed institution, faced a decline, if not to disappear. In fact, the prison has made a spectacular return uh, to the institutional forefront across the first and the second worlds uh, over the last uh, quarter century. Then I'm going to say, well, how do we make sense of this uh, or unfor or unforeseen twist of history? And I'm going to argue that it bespeaks a transformation of the state. The return of the prison is part of an exercise in statecraft. It is part of the building of the neoliberal Leviathan. But to realize that, to realize that the prison is a political institution, a core capacity of the state, we have to do two things. We have to change our conception of the prison. We are taught to think of the prison as an institution that handles crime. I want to argue that it's an institution that manages dispossessed and dishonored groups and manages urban marginality. We also must think the way we think of the state. We must move from what I call the ambulance conception of the state, the state that comes when uh, undesirable conditions or conducts emerge out of the market or out of civil society. Like an ambulance, the state comes in and remedies the matter. And I want to argue that the state um, doesn't simply remedy conditions downstream, but rather it is an agency that stratifies and classifies and thus co-produces inequality and marginality upstream. For that, I'm going to draw on Esping Anderson. I'm going to draw on Bourdieu. Uh, and then I'm going to begin to elaborate the notion of penal state through a double return. First, a return to social history, back to the origins of the prison in the 16th century. I'm going to then return to classical social theory, our hallowed triad of Marx, Durkheim, and Weber, and I'm going to argue uh, that they give us an analytic agenda which entails making three breaks. First, we must break out of the crime and punishment box. Second, we must reunite social and penal policy, think of them as two variants of poverty policy. And thirdly, we must end the uh, sort of theological opposition between materialist uh, analysis of penality descended from Marx and Engels um, and symbolic analysis uh, of penality descended from Durkheim. And luckily, to make these three breaks, that's quite an agenda there, we have a single concept will suffice. The concept of bureaucratic field forged by Bourdieu, which I'm, I'm going to uh, deploy to both argue that we have moved into e the era of the double regulation of poverty through the combination of restrictive workfare and expensive prison fare, I will explicate the model of penalization as a state reaction to the diffusing social insecurity uh, produced by economic deregulation um, in the neoliberal age. And then I'm going to argue that then we can use the contemporary transformation of penality as a springboard to anatomize the making of the neoliberal state. And I will uh, provide a sociological characterization of neoliberalism. And then I will say next for, for the next generation, for the years to come, let's not be so <laughs> grand. Uh, for the years to come, I will um, propose that we can plumb penality as a core state capacity through three concepts. The concept of penal segmentation, the concept of judicial citizenship, and the concept of negative sociodicy. And I will end with a shout out, uh, not to the primary school of my hometown in southern France, uh, as a, uh, a former candidate to the vice presidency of the United States but with a shout out to students of class citizenship and global transformation to help us bring the penal state back in. So, oh, 
a few caveats. Um, <laughs> the caveats is, you know, in sketching the big picture model of the third age of penal expansion, the one we are living in, and an analytic strategy for parsing the prison as a political institution, I will of necessity simplify, overlook numerous counter trends, empirical anomalies, theoretical complications, and I'm sure I'm gonna be called on that uh, later this evening. I am mindful of Lucia Zedner's warning against the dangers of dystopia in penal theory and wary of the risk of falling in what Pat O'Malley calls the criminologies of catastrophe uh, that seem to leave no room for contestation and resistance and whose millenarist cast can mask alternative room for, uh, for alternative historical paths. My response to these cautions is, is threefold. First, the, ca the carceral catastrophe is already upon us. And so we'd better face it if we want to stop or reverse it. Second, the state strategy of penalization of urban marginality, of which carceral expansion is one expression, is replete with contradictions, incongruities, gaps that render it erratic and unstable. But to spotlight and exploit this contradiction, we must first understand the coherence uh, behind it. And so that will be my task. And thirdly, uh, the penal surge of Century Stern is not a preordained historical development. It is not propelled by some ir irresistible systemic logic, be that of late modernity, biopower, globalization of deregulated capitalism. Rather, it is the product of conversing, converging policy choices that have eroded the economic state, eroded the social capacities of the state while favoring penal responses to social insecurity over other responses such as the social welfare or the medical response if you take a condition such as drug addiction and consumption, for instance. <laughs> By bringing the penal state back in, I want to stress precisely that penal policy is the product, is the tool, and is the object of political struggles. What struggles have done, struggles can undo. The return of a penal state is not inevitable, but to wage the fight for historical alternatives efficiently, we must understand what the stakes of these fights are, and for me, the stakes are the remaking of the state. So now we can launch into um, the presentation. The days of imprisonment as a method of mass treatment of lawbreakers are largely over. What remains of it will have to employ much more scientific methods of selection and treatment in order to survive. This pronouncement made in 1942 uh, did not issue from the mouth of a radical critic of incarceration. It is the prediction made by Hermann Mannheim, the eminent German legal scholar and pillar of mainstream penology, who after emigrating uh, uh, from Germany to England in 1934, taught at the LSE, where the Mannheim Center is named after him, founded the association that later became the British Society of Criminology, and trained le the leading criminologists and reformers of the British uh, justice system after World War War II. This prediction encapsulates a vision that dominated the period 1945-1975, the apogee of the 40s Keynesian era, according to which the prison was on its way down and out. An institution in crisis and remission bound to recede to the organizational backstage of modern society if not to disappear entirely. Indeed, Menheim's uh, prophecy uh, was echoed two decades later by Norval Morris, the most influential criminal law professor and justice advocate of his generation in the United States. In a 1965 paper published in a Festschrift uh, to Ermine Mannheim, Morris did not mince words. Listen to these words. It is confidently predicted that before the end of this century, prison in its present form will become extinct, though the word may live on. Now, a decade later, the revisionist historian of the prison, David Rothman, writing against the backdrop of a slow but steady decline in the convict population and the tumultuous rise of the prisoners' rights movement in America, reasserted in the discovery of the asylums that the United States was, quote, gradually escaping from institutional responses to social problems, such that, quote, one can foresee the period when incarceration will be used still more rarely than it is today. Indeed, in 1972, Rothman published an article in the very important journal, The Public Interest, called Off Prisons, Asylums, and Other Decaying Institutions. Then came the lightning bolt of Michel Foucault. His dazzling and puzzling discipline and punish in 1975, drawing 
the joint genealogy of the ascent of biopower and the disciplinary society, Foucault found that the penitentiary technique was diffusing throughout the wider social body. And as surveillance, classification, examination, ordering, and coding spread from the prison to the factory, the hospital, the convent, the school, and the family, they wove together a panoptic lattice that rendered the prison secondary, if not expendable. Indeed, Foucault writes, in the midst of these practices of normalization, which are becoming ever tighter, the specificity of the prison and its role as hinge lose something of their raison d'etre. By then, the fate of the prison seems so gloomy that radical criminologists, such as Stanley Cohen, turn to criticizing not incarceration, but decarceration, warning of the perils of the blurring and dispersal of penal power via community sanctions, and stressing, quote, the overriding fact of proliferation, elaboration, and diversification of social control. Net strengthening, net widening, net meshing beyond the prison became the agenda of uh, uh, critical criminology. Then the mushrooming of anti-prison groups in North America and Western Europe, the coalescence of abolitionism as a new paradigm in criminology and policy advocacy, the burst of activist mobilization for inmate rights and the wave of carceral riots that shook several advanced societies near simultaneously in the 1970s completed this picture of the pen penitentiary as a moribund institution in swift and irrevocable decline doomed to lose its rank as the preeminent instrument of state punishment, if not to face outright extinction. Well, this rosy forecast of the end of the prison as we know it did not come to pass. Far from becoming extinct, the carceral institution has made a stunning comeback onto the institutional foreground across the first and the second worlds um, over the past quarter century. With precious few exceptions, Canada, Germany, Austria, and parts of Scandinavia, Incarceration has increased in all post-industrial societies, leading to the onset of hyper-incarceration in the United States with the multiplication by five of the prison population between 1973 and 2000, uh, making the US the world lead world champion in incarceration with 750 inmates per 100,000 residents. <coughs> but has led also to steady and sturdy growth across Western Europe, spectacular expansion in second world societies such as Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, South Africa, and the huge growth of prison in the nation state issued from the collapse of the Soviet empire. Indeed, so now if we turn to the growth of the carceral population in the countries of the European Union, um, we see on this diagram um, an increase in nearly all the members of the uh, European Union at 12. Uh, we see roughly three groups of countries, a strong rise by about one half of the prison population in France, Italy, Belgium a near doubling, um, and now this is, this is the population, see England, uh, oh, of course, there's no point in pointing, this is something I haven't learned from, the, uh, from my first PowerPoint presentation. You can see uh, England uh, leading the pack uh, with a sturdy growth, uh, then uh, Spain uh, really doing very well, uh, catching up. Um, Italy has had some difficulty in recent period, but uh, has done well in the last two years. Um, uh, France is steadily there. Now you can say, well, this prison, pop prison population total, it doesn't take into account demographic growth. So let's look at uh, rising incarceration rates. And here we see strong rising incarceration rates in th with three groups of countries. A strong rise by about one half in France, Italy, and Belgium. A near doubling between 70 and 115% growth in England and Wales. Sweden, Portugal, Greece, and a near quadrupling of the incarceration rate for Spain and the Netherlands, long held as a model of humane penality. Netherlands went in 15 years from being the last country of Europe to being nearly uh, the first. Trends in, car in the carceral evolution in Western Europe suggest that the third age of confinement uh, feared by Thomas Matheson 20 years ago is upon us. So with precious few exceptions, we observe everywhere rising volumes and rates of incarceration, overcrowding, disproportionate weight of foreigners and drug convicts, uh, disproportionate uh, representation of the homeless, the mentally ill, the reduction of incarceration to warehousing. Worldwide, we know that the prison population jumped from just over 8 million in 1998 to nearly 10 million today, exclusive of the administrative det detentions in China, which would add another million people. 
We can safely say that Roy Walmsley and the International Center for Prison Studies at King's College, who are doing a fabulous job of keeping track of carceral expansion around the world, are not about to go out of business anytime soon. Uh, now, this unforeseen and relentless rise in the incarceration is only one crude surface manifestation of the expansion and exaltation of the penal state. Other indicators would include the elevation of crime fighting to the rank of government priority everywhere, the salience of insecurity, understood strictly as criminal insecurity in election campaigns, criminal hyperactivity on the legislative front, New Labour instituted a stunning 3,605 new offenses, criminal offenses, in the 11 years it has been in power. France has voted 23 laws pertaining to crime and insecurity since the mid-2002. Uh, California passed 1,000 laws extending the use of imprisonment in 10 years in the 1980s. We observe also the diffusion of a public discourse of vituperation of criminals and convicts, with Blair telling off the homeless in the uh, April 1997 campaign, Nicolas Sarkozy promising to clean out the scum of the housing projects of the periphery of Paris um, with a, a power hose in the campaign leading to the French presidential election, um, and so on and so forth. We see a widening of the penal length through the growth of alternative sanctions, post-custodial schemes of control, the exponential development of judicial databases, diversification of their use, the mushrooming of administrative retention centers throughout Europe where tens of thousands of irregular migrants are detained awaiting processing or expulsion and who do not figure in the uh, uh, statistics for incarceration. All these developments disconnected from crime. Um, in the US, the carceral uh, population quintupled while victimization rates were stagnant from 75 to 93 and then rapidly receding in the UK carceral inflation took off just as the UK was about to uh, ex experience 10 years of de de decline in its crime rate, according to a recent paper by Tim Newburn. Similarly in France, there's no connection between the recent uh, boom in imprisonment and the trends in crime. So how are we to make sense of these? The stunning penal surge and the rehabilitation of the prison on the political scene is a transformation of the state, an exercise in statescraft, the building of a neoliberal leviathan. The expansion, the exaltation of the police, the courts, and the prison as public services partake of the redrawing of the perimeter, the priorities, the missions, and the modalities of action of the state. So properly, uh, properly thinking, it's a problem of political, in political sociology of which political sociologists have said nothing, about which political scientists have not written uh, 10 pages, except for one uh, uh, Mary Gottschalk, uh, singular uh, political scientist in the United States who has written on the topic. So I'm gonna argue that the stunning return of the prison is not linked to crime, it is not the coming of the exclusive society with Jock Young, it is not the coming of the risk society of Pat O'Malley, it is not the coming of late modernity of David Garland. It is not post-modernity with John Pat and Jonathan Simon. Not moral cycles and legal fads and distrust in government, according to Michael Tonry. But it is the remaking of the state in the age of triumphant neoliberalism. Or rather, under the press of neoliberalization as a transnational political project entailing the reconfiguration of the triad of market, state, and citizenship that of course starts from different baselines in different countries has been more or less successful and more or less enthusiastically embraced or more or less successfully resisted but is present and is looming everywhere. The return of the prison is one element in a triple transformation of the state. First, the withdrawal of the economic state. Second, the retraction and recomposition of the social state transformed into a trampoline to insecure employment with a shift from welfare to uh, uh, workfare, and third, the growth and glorification of the penal state. The neoliberal revolution has brought back the prison as a vacuum cleaner of the detritus of the market society, as a disciplinary device to impose insecure work on the precarious fractions of the post-industrial proletariat, and as a signifying machine and moral theater to project the fortitude of the ruler and to shore up the deficit of legitimacy that politicians suffer everywhere when they abandon the traditional missions of economic and social protection of the state. 
Now, to realize that the prison is a political institution, a core capacity of the state to manage inequality, marginality, to stabilize and symbolize salient so social boundaries, to stage sovereignty, and to generate legitimacy for public officials. We have to change our conception of the prison, and we have to change our conception of the state. And when we made the two, then we have an adequate conception of the penal state. We have to change our conception um, of the prison, and for that, we can get to our next slide. We have to change our conception of the prison from an instrument to fight crime to a device for the management of marginality, and we have to change our conception of the state from a reactive to a proactive agency, from an ambulance that intervenes downstream to remedy undesirable conditions and conducts, to an agency that stratifies and classifies. Stratifies, this is the lesson that I take from the work of uh, Gusta Esping Anderson. I'm, I'm borrowing not his classic typology of the three worlds of welfare state, but rather the conception of the welfare state that underlies them, uh, that sees the state as determining the contemporary shape of the post-industrial post class order by actually shaping uh, uh, stratification. And then I'm borrowing uh, also from Bourdieu, who teaches us that the state, via the law and the school in particular, is a classifying agency that wields symbolic powers, that inculcates and diffuses classifications through which we make sense and construct the world, and through which we come to accept the world as it is, as it is, as it is uh, preconstituted. And so I'm going to argue, um, Gustav Esping Anderson says the welfare state is a stratifying agency. Well, let's take that and use that for the penal state. The penal state is a stratifying agency. Bourdieu tells us uh, the state is a classifying agency, particularly through the school system. Well, I'm going to argue the penal state is a classifying agency. And let's look at the penal state as a stratifying and classifying agency. So I want to begin to elaborate the notion of penal state, argue for its centrality in the study of inequality, public policy and citizenship at centuries dawn. I'm particularly interested to understand how the building of the neoliberal Leviathan impacts the formation and the fate of the precariat, the precarious fractions of the post-industrial proletariat trapped in the neighborhoods of relegation of the dualizing metropolis that are the privileged targets of the rolling out of the police, the courts, and the prison. But I contend that the relevance of penality as a core state capacity goes well beyond the particular population processed by the police the courts uh, and the prison system. It impacts the broad citizenry and shapes social and symbolic space in total. This is because, for instance, the, the legal and cultural construction of the criminal and the citizen are coeval to each other. Historians have shown that by defining the criminal and how to treat him, the penal state defines the citizen by contraposition. For instance, in his sweeping account of changes in criminal law in Victorian and Edwardian England, reconstructing the criminal, Martin Joel Wiener has shown how the revaluation of the criminal in English law and culture redefined the figure of the citizen. Similarly, we have beautiful works by historians of crime and culture and politics in Latin America, Pablo Picato, City of Suspects, Crime in Mexico City, or Thomas Holloway, Policing Rio de Janeiro, that show a similar process. So now, how do we go about constructing a notion of penal state? Well, I'll propose let's first return to social history. Back to the origins of the prison in the 16th century. Here, I'm going to draw selectively on some classics. Uh, Ruschen Kirchheimer, Punishment in Social Structure. Gary Meck, uh, Punishment and Pity. Katarina, Katarina Lis and Hugo Soli, Poverty and Capitalism in Pre-Industrial Europe. And Peter Spierenberg, uh, The Prison Experience. I have to really uh, go very quickly to what, uh, uh, what we learn from these works. It, just let me give you one quote from uh, the master work, Master History of Poverty by the historian Bronislav Geremek. He reminds us that, quote, before prison became a method of punishment and corrections of criminals on a large scale, modern Europe made it into a tool for the implementation of its social policy towards beggars and the means of the conspicuous affirmation of the work ethic in those countries that took the path of capitalist development. Indeed, the first houses of correction, the Bridewell of London, the Rasfuis of Amsterdam, the L'Hôpital General of Paris, emerged in the period 1560 to 1670 and were invented not in reaction to crime and to the rise and spread of, but to the rise and spread of urban marginality as vagrants and beggars gathered in the burgeoning cities. Key words to their establishment were idleness, immorality, 
Their purpose was to clean up the streets, to impose social and moral order on the disruptive poor, and to discipline the nascent urban working class by dramatizing the work ethic. And indeed, here we, I'm going to basically go very, very quickly and draw four lessons of social history. And, and basically, my argument, that would have been enough for one talk, and had I not given a, a, a very detailed abstract to Nicola, I would have said, well, that's enough to make one talk, but then I felt like I can't do that to her. And, so I'm going to have to develop everything, and then there's not enough time. But, but <laughs> Basically, the argument could boil down, go back to the 16th century, learn from the 16th century, and then apply the lessons of the 16th century to the 21st century. And let's see how much mileage you can get. And I agree, you can get a lot of mileage. Here are four lessons from social history. First, the prison was invented to manage not crime, but urban marginality, idleness. And in particular, one target of the Houses of Correction was a category called the sturdy beggar. <laughs> the sturdy beggar was, of course, the undeserving poor of today, the welfare chief, the ones who don't want to work, who want to be on the dole, and have to be disciplined, and have to have the enabling state come and teach them how to work. Second, it started out as a hybrid institution combining pity and punishment, welfare support and penal redress. Then gradually the social question and the penal question got separated in the half century after 1848. But my argument here is that by the end of the 20th century we have seen the renewed fusion and confusion of the social welfare and the criminal question. At the bottom of the class and ethnic order. In the US, that means lower class blacks in the collapsing ghetto, in Europe, post colonial migrants in the inner city or the peripheral housing estates. Third lesson the prison has always been deployed selectively. Indeed, as you rise up the class structure, you will note that sanctions for crimes move, move from penal to civil law and to administrative regulation and even self regulation for crimes committed, for instance, on the stock markets. <laughs> Fourth, the rise of the prison was part and parcel of modern state building. Indeed, to this day, failing states are distinctively states that cannot monopolize violence, fail to uphold the law, and pra or practice the misrule of law as is current in Latin America after the return of electoral democracy. Now, all four propositions, I would argue, apply today. Not only has the prison returned to the institutional forefront of advanced society, it has filled up with its most vulnerable members, the human detritus of a dualizing social order, the jobless, the homeless, paperless migrants, drug addicts, the mentally ill, who are everywhere the privileged clients of custodial institutions. And this is why the prison, still to this day, is the near preserve of the subproletariat. If you draw a social profile of inmates in the US, in the UK, in France, you get the same picture of a population overwhelmingly composed of unemployed working class uh, individuals in the United States, for instance, fewer than uh, jail detainees held a full-time job at the time of their arraignment. Two-thirds come from households with annual income of less than half of the poverty line, not less than the poverty line, less than half of the poverty line. 13% only had some post-secondary education compared to half for the national average. If you zoom to the UK, you will find in the study by Rod Morgan that 83% of inmates are issued from the working class, 43% left school before the age of 16, over one third are jobless, a full 13% are homeless. If you look at French inmates, one half of inmates were without a job at the time of their arraignment, half of them have a primary school education, 17% have no regular residence, over one half were of foreign origin or foreign uh, parentage. The prison is not only a receptacle for the poor, but a crucible of poverty. It's, it furthermore impoverishes, impoverishes its clientele. Today, more than ever in the 20th century, the natural customers of European jails and prisons are the precarious fractions of the working class, and most especially young people from working class families of African ancestry, where we see a massive overrepresentation of foreigners. Indeed, post-colonial foreigners in the prisons of Europe are more overrepresented compared to nationals in Europe, in 10 of the 15 largest European countries, then blacks are relative to whites in the United States. Now, how do we, so you go back to history and you find out that the prison is central to state building, that it's about managing poverty and marginality. So you would have thought that students of the state, particularly students of state formation, would have kept the prison uh, at the center of their interest. But what's interesting is that the prison pulls a double disappearing act. 
Now, whereas theories of early state formation, Marx, Weber, Hinz, Elias, Tilly, explicitly recognize the monopolization of coercion and the centralization of justice as key to the making of the Leviathan, the prison subsequently disappears from political sociology and state theory, just as the state disappears from criminology. And so we have to return to classical social theory. Um, and, then, and we return to classical social theory, um, and we're going to take three notions. For Marx, we're going to take the idea that penality that the state, the law, and thus punishment, as the arm enforcing the law, play a pivotal role in periods of economic restructuring, in tamping down disorders, upholding property relations, disciplining labor, and buttressing class rule. Beautiful 1843 essay on the theft of wood among the wine gro growers of the Moselle that has all of these elements in one. So we're going to take that. And, you know, this is our sort of materialist, instrumental uh, approach to penality as a means of control. Durkheim, for Durkheim, penality is central. Penality is an index of solidarity. The wild gyrations of penality today suggest a crisis in the mode of integration. <laughs> the kind and amount of punishment are a reflection of the degree of authority of the state. Punishment is a passionate reaction of the social body that expresses shared sentiments and serves to draw boundaries and broadcast norms. So Durkheim gives us a symbolic analysis of the expressive function of punishment as a means of communication, tapping of emotion, communication, and building community. And then from Weber, I'm going to borrow the notion that penality is a theater of sovereignty and a resource for legitimacy. Um, and in particular, I want to develop the notion of emotional legitimacy, the idea that the state garners support by alternately tapping and feeding currents of collective sentiments, of resentment, of anxiety, of fear, of vengeance, Sentiments that are born from the crisis of solidarity uh, and integration that Durkheim diagnoses and are produced by the class transformation highlighted by Marx. Um, so this is our, my notion of penality as emotional transistor. If I had more time, we'd go to Elias. And in particular, I think Carl Schmitt has a very interesting notion in his development of the concept of the political. He argues that politics is essentially about drawing a boundary between the friend and the enemy. And I'm struck by how much of the discourse on crime today takes the uh, military stick language of war and treats you know, criminals or deviants in general as, or uh, I was just reading an article in the newspaper coming on the train. Uh, France has declared a war on school truancy. You know? So meaning truants are like an enemy of the state. So, but we don't have time. <laughs> so from this return to social theory, we take this threefolded agenda. That we have to get out of the crime and punishment trap because we can't explain what is going on if we follow trends in crime. They explain nothing. We have to reunite social and penal policy because they are the two wings of the uh, marginality policy and map their joint effect at the bottom of the class, ethnic, and spatial structure. And then we have to hold together the material dimension of control and the symbolic dimension of communication and community building. And move from looking at penality as an instrument of repression to an instrument of production. Production of new categories, production of new discourses, production of new bureaucracies, production of new public programs, production of a new state. <laughs> And luckily, we can do that with one single notion, the notion of bureaucratic field that allows us to retain those insights to introduce the relational, historicist, and agonistic mode that characterizes Bourdieu's theory. We can look at, so there are generic properties of the bureaucratic, now the bureaucratic field, and let me, the bureaucratic field is, is Bourdieu's way of rethinking the state. Um, um, and he, um, he proposed in particular that, that we may think of the state as the set of agencies that have successfully monopolized the definition and the distribution of public goods. Um, and like every field, the bureaucratic field is a force field. Those who enter into, in it are subjected to objective forces beyond their own control. But it's also a battlefield. Um, and it is endowed with a certain autonomy, but its autonomy can be curtailed. Um, it exercises prismatic effects, that is like economic forces coming are gonna come through the bureaucratic field 
and their impact are going to be refracted by the structure of the bureaucratic field, and there are struggles going on in the bureaucratic field. The bureaucratic field itself, that is the state, is the product of past struggles, but it is also an instrument of struggle. You can use the state to wage struggles. It is the stake of struggles. You can struggle for state power, or to modify the state, or to have medical treatment of marginality, for say, or drug addiction, as opposed to penal treatment. And is also an agent in, in struggles, because it is, it is itself endowed with a relative autonomy. And it is a terrain of struggles. All of these things, um, all of these things lead us to um, the following analysis. Bourdieu proposes that we can look at the state not as a monolith, but as a coordinated ensemble, or, uh, but, but as a splintered space of forces, so that vie over the definition and distribution of public goods, the bureaucratic field. And he proposes that this state, this, this space is structured around two oppositions, an opposition between the high and the low state nobility, the high state nobility that wants to reform the state along the lines of the market, the low state nobility that wants to keep, protect the established uh, missions of the state coming from the Keynesian Fordist era, and an opposition between the left hand and the right hand of the state. The left hand is the feminine side of Leviathan. It materializes by the spendthrift ministries in charge of social functions, public education, health, housing, welfare, and labor law. It offers protection and succor for the social categories that are deprived of economic and cultural capital. The right hand is the masculine side, is charged with enforcing the new economic discipline via budget cuts, fiscal incentives, and economic deregulation. Now, by inviting us to grasp in a single conceptual framework the various sectors of the state that administer the life conditions and the life chances of the lower class, and to view these sectors as enmeshed in relations of antagonistic cooperation um, as they vie for preeminence inside the bureaucratic field, Bourdieu's conception helps us map the ongoing shift from the social to the penal treatment of urban marginality. It allows us to see, to insert, now what I do in my book, Punishing the poor, in a sense, I insert uh, the penal state, I insert the police, the courts, and the prison as core constituents of the right hand of the state alongside the Ministry of the Economy and the Budget. And I argue that what we are seeing in the contemporary period is the joining, the double shift, the shift from the right to welfare as a protection from the sanctions of the market to the obligation of workfare as conditional social support if you orient yourself to employment, and that we have moved from the single regulation of poverty through welfare to the double regulation by the joining of the left hand and the right hand, the joining of restrictive welfare and expensive prison fare that affect the double regulation of poverty. This takes the form of, on the one side, the shift from the social to the penal wing of the state, detectable in the reallocation of public budgets, public priorities, personnel, discursive precedents given over crime control, over social welfare, but also by the colonization of the welfare sector by the panoptic and punitive logic character characteristic of the post-rehabilitation penal bureaucracy. Now, <laughs> then now, why? Why and how? It says, what is the mechanism? You know, it says we get, and this is where we get to the core of the model. In a sense, this is the, this is, you know, open the hood and let's look inside what's going on in the engine. Why do we get this? Um, here I want to explicate the analytical core of my model. Um, this is neoliberal policy. First, you deregulate your economy, which means re-regulate in favor of firms, because deregulation is really not deregulation at all. In fact, there's been a profusion of means of regulating the economy, but in favor of firms. At the top, it means unleashing flows of capital. At the bottom, it means deregulate, flexibilizing the labor market. Now, as you bring economic deregulation, you increase poverty and social insecurity at the bottom of the class structure. And as you increase social insecurity and turbulence, you create incentives for criminal activity, or you create unemployment, or you an anchor uh, long-term unemployment, underemployment, insecure employment, and deproletarization being outside of the labor market entirely and therefore having to live in the informal economy of the street. So economic deregulation increases social insecurity. Well, you have to respond to this social insecurity and the disorders that it creates, the turbulence it creates in the lower class districts. Well, traditionally you would respond by expanding welfare, but you can't expand welfare because if you expand welfare, 
You provide a protective device that will allow people to escape from the insecure employment that you're trying to impose. So you must have the move from welfare to workfare. That is, protection from the sanction of the market to a trampoline into insecure employment. But as you move from welfare to workfare, you increase, you further intensify, you double down on your social insecurity and, and social and economic turbulence at the bottom of the class structure. And therefore, you have to contain the disorders that you have created, you the state have created, by deregulating the economy and shrinking the social protection. And so you respond by activa activating the penal state. You roll out the police, the courts, and the prison system in and around the neighborhoods of relegation that are the primary target or the primary receptacles of the process of intensification of social insecurity. But social insecurity also translates into mental insecurity. There is a destabilization of the established ways of thinking, the social anxiety, the fear of downward mobility, of falling down, a staggering statistic, 85% of the French think that they could become homeless. Now this is, you know, this testifies to a level of social anxiety that is totally out of proportion with the actual objective risk. Um, so you see social insecurity, you have objective social insecurity, but also subjective social insecurity that translates to social anxiety. That, and the two, the so growing social insecurity and social anxiety creates a deficit of legitimacy for politicians. Why are you going to vote for somebody who can't, you know, who is proposing policies where we can't basically stabilize your life and order it? So what politicians will propose is they will propose in, in, for the demand for social stability or social order, they will respond by the supply of criminal order, law and order policies that are a sort of displaced substitute for a response to the growing social insecurity and the deficit of legitimacy that strikes politicians when they forsake, when they organize uh, the ending, uh, the abandonment of the traditional mission of social and economic protection of the state. Now, you could complexify this model and enter other, other streams of social anxiety, transformation of family relations, transformation of age, uh, relations, transformation of gender um, relations, the, the pluralization of sexualities that, that, that destabilize the family, there's the in insecurity, instability, anxiety or, or around the family is of course reinforced by insecure employment, the two interact and feed this wide current of social anxiety coursing through the social body. The, the, the passage through the universal mode of academic reproduction of class, where now with the universalization of secondary schooling, also creates dramatic anxiety among the working class. You have also political operators, media operators, that are going to attack the social anxiety that's coursing through the social body and, and intensify it and aggravate the deficit of legitimacy, thus creating the conditions under which law order policies are going to be a, a very highly valuable policy for politicians, and particularly, the paradox is particularly for left politicians. And I think this is why my model explains why it is the left and not the right in Europe that has embraced law and order, uh, uh, law and order policies and punitive policies. It is Blair uh, in England, it is uh, Jospin in France, it is uh, Gonzalez in Spain, it is D'Alema in Italy, and not the right-wingers. It is the left because for the left, the deficit of legitimacy is particularly severe because they have been elected to provide social and economic protection. And they have continued the rollback of economic deregulation and continued the shrinking of the social safety net. And therefore, for them, the deficit of legitimacy is particularly uh, striking. Now, you could add race and immigration and space. It would make the model too complicated to even graph. But now, uh, I'm going to have to. So this is how, this is how we can account. Um, for this remarkable uh, um, correlation that we observe between poverty, welfare, um, and incarceration. Uh, and in, in, in a 1996 paper, actually, I, I, I argued that, that the United States, as it was downsizing welfare, was upsizing its prison, and that the two movements were, in a sense, the two sides of the transformation of the state. Then I edited an issue of the journal Acte de la Recherche en Sciences Sociales, From Social State to Penal State, and then I argued in Prisons of Poverty, that actually this policy was diffusing, that those countries that were following the US model and shrinking their social welfare state were also then increasing their penal state. Then Western and Beckett uh, found uh, in the study of the 50 states in the United States, and indeed there was an inverse correlation across the 50 states of the United States. Those that have meager welfare states have 
high prisons, and conversely, then Downs and Hansen in a 2007 paper redid this analysis for 19 OECD countries and found that particularly for the recent period, not for the early period, which goes very well with my argument, but for the recent decade, indeed there is a robust inverse correlation between the strength of welfare and uh, the uh, strength of, uh, of, of prison fare. And Nicola Lacey, in her book, The Prisoner's Dilemma, uh, proposes a beautiful diagram that I wish I could have reproduced, but it was too late. I read the book uh, on the plane and I didn't have the technology to scan the, the diagram, but it's a beautiful diagram where she has what is basically an indicator, an index of neoliberalization. And, and she charts the, the, the incarceration rate and you know, plots the incarceration rate by in, index of, of neoliberalization and finds a near perfect uh, correlation between these two variables. And indeed, these structural variables, inequality, poverty, and employment, are outcomes of state policies. This implies that incarceration is a product of state policies, not just justice policies, but the gamut of distributive policies, not redistributive policies. But incarceration is the product of the gamut of distributive policies whereby the states allocate economic goods, social goods, educational goods, housing goods, health goods, and so on and so forth. Now, then from there, I'm, I'm going to co come to uh, the close. I'm an arg I want to argue so that the return of the prison there is part and parcel of the building of the neoliberal state. And indeed, then we can use the study of prison and penality as a way of moving from an economic conception of neoliberalism to a properly sociological conception of uh, neoliberalism. Uh, now, neoliberalism is, a, is an elusive and contested notion, sort of suspended between the polemic language of politics on the one side and the technical idiom of social science. But through the many conceptions, there is one dominant core, and it's an economic, even economistic conception that stresses an array of market-friendly policies, such as labor deregulation, capital mobility, privatization, a monetarist agenda of deflation and financial autonomy, trade liberalization, interplace competition, and the reduction of taxation and public expenditures. My argument here is that this conception is very thin, very incomplete indeed. This is the ideology of neoliberalism. This is not a sociology of neoliberalism. Because in reality, neoliberalism as it actually exists does not correspond to uh, this schema. In this schema, we do have market rule. Um, so in, 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 the, in, the, in the sociological conception of neoliberalism that I propose, um, I propose that neoliberalism entails not simply the reassertion of the prerogatives of capital and the promotion of the marketplace, but rather the articulation of four institutional logics. First, market rule, yes, economic deregulation, that is re-regulation aimed at promoting the market or market-like mechanisms as the optimal device for organizing all human activities, uh, including the private provision of core public goods on putative grounds of efficiency. But it also entails the building of work, the workfare component. Welfare state devolution, retraction, and recomposition to facilitate the expansion and to support the intensification of commodification, and in particular to submit reticent individuals to the discipline of insecure wage labor via variants of workfare, establishing a quasi-contractual relationship between the state and lower class recipients who are treated not as citizens, but rather as clients or subjects. Uh, who, you know, who have to uh, fulfill behavioral obligations as a condition of continued public assistance. Thirdly, we have what I contend is prison fare, an expensive, intrusive, and proactive penal apparatus that penetrates the lower regions of social and physical space to contain the disorders and the disarray generated by the diffusion of social insecurity and deepening inequality, that unfurls disciplinary supervision over the precarious fractions of the post-industrial proletariat and reasserts the authority of the Leviathan so as to bolster the evaporating legitimacy of elected officials. And then fourthly, we have, and here we have the beautiful meeting of the fourth element and the third element, we have the cult of individual responsibility, a cultural trope which invades all spheres of life to provide what C. Wright Mills would call a vocabulary of motive, 
for the construction of the self on the model of the entrepreneur, the spread of markets, and the legitimation of the widened competition that the market substands, the counterpart of which is, of course, the evasion of corporate liability and the proclamation of state irresponsibility or sharply reduced state accountability, particularly on the social and economic front. So a central ideological tenet of neoliberalism is that it entails the coming of small government, the shrinking of the allegedly flaccid and overgrown Keynesian welfare state, and its makeover into the lean and nimble enabling state or workfare state, which, quote, invests in human capital, and quote, activates communal springs and individual appetites for work and civil participation through, quote, partnerships, stressing self-reliance, commitment to paid work, and managerialism, you will have recognized here the third way proposed by Anthony Giddens, an erstwhile director of this hallowed institution. In reality, the neoliberal state turns out to be quite different. The neoliberal state is in fact a centaur state, liberal at the top, paternalistic at the bottom. It embraces laissez-faire at the top, releasing restraints on capital and expanding the life chances of the holders of economic and cultural capital, but it is anything but laissez-faire at the bottom. At the bottom, indeed, when it comes to handling the social turbulence generated by deregulation and to impressing the discipline of precarious labor, the new Leviathan is fiercely, in fiercely interventionist, bossy, and pricey. Now, this is, this is an element of neoliberalism that has, missed, that has been missed by both its apologists, Anthony Giddens, in the third way, and its critics, David Harvey, who, uh, who discusses briefly uh, the penal, uh, penal institutions, but under the rubric of repression, uh, which I argue is, is inadequate. Now, I will come to the conclusion. Um, to, um, yeah, well, I have a whole section that I'm going to skip. Which really is the section that interests me when I wrote it. <laughs> so it's kind of a. You know, but, but basically, in a nutshell, the argument is how, then how do we track the impact of the resurging uh, penal state at the bottom of the class structure? And there are proposed three concepts. The concept of penal segmentation, which is the idea that the state draws boundaries and draws lines, in particular, the line between the deserving and the undeserving poor, is included in drawn not simply by workfare, but also by prison fare. Uh, the notion of judicial citizenship that I add to T.H. Marshall, uh, Marshall's uh, three spheres of citizenship, the civil, the political, and the social, I argue that there's one particular dimension of citizenship, which is judicial citizenship, in particular having a criminal justice background, which acts as a subtractive element, and which is becoming an ever more important uh, dimension of citizenship for two categories. Lower the destitute lower class, which very often have a criminal justice background, which then creates a whole series of handicaps and curtailment of their life chances down the road, but also foreigners and immigrants. And in a sense, the, the, double, the management of the two boundaries of Europe, for instance, the, or advanced societies, the external boundaries with foreigners and the internal boundaries of class are increasingly managed through judicial citizenship. And the third element is the element that I call uh, uh, negative, uh, negative sociodicy. And here I, I borrow on Weber and on Bourdieu, who argues that um, higher education, um, the, the, distribution of, the distribution of credentials by elite institutions in particular, uh, proposes a justification of the privilege of the dominant. It's cultural capital inherited, but it provides a justification uh, for um, justifies the success, the wealth, the eminence of those who are in higher social positions. And I argue that the prison is similar, it's sort of like, you can, you can think of the prison as a negative university. It gives negative degrees. Um, it, 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 it gives people uh, you know, a title, you know, negative cultural capital, uh, that will then you know, be used to explain their failure, their poverty, their dereliction, their degradation. And by invoking the same ideology of merit, Merit at the top, demerit at the bottom. And in both cases, uh, the, 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 the positive sociology of privilege at the top and the negative sociology of destitution at the bottom, um, we have the language of individual responsibility uh, is used. So in this lecture, to conclude for real, I have argued that because history has brought the prison back 
to the institutional forefront of, of advanced societies in response to rising social insecurity. We need to bring the penal state back to the center of the sociology of urban inequality, public policy, and citizenship. But for that, we must change the way we think of both the state and the prison. I have drawn on social history, on classical theory, and on the comparative analysis of the penalization of urban poverty in post-industrial countries at century's end to propose that the police, the courts, and the prison are not just technical tools for handling deviance, but rather core political capacities through which the state stratifies and classifies, manages marginality, stages sovereignty, and defines the boundaries and import of citizenship. I have deployed Bourdieu's concept of bureaucratic field in conjunction from, with principles from Esping Anderson and T.H. Marshall to propose that the coupling of restrictive work fare and expensive prison fare is a response not to rising crime or to the risks of late modernity spread across the society, but a response to rising social insecurity and its ramifying reverberations, not across society, but at the bottom of the class and spatial order. I have also argued that neoliberalism entails not the coming of small government, but the creation of a centaur state, laissez-faire at the top, paternalistic and interventionist at the bottom, implying an expansion of its law enforcement arm, and thus the deployment of penalization as a technique of government. I want to close with a shout out to students of urban inequality and class formation, students of citizenship and students of globalization, that gentle name that the neoliberal revolution has given to itself. A shout out to include penal institutions and policies in their theoretical models and their empirical investigations. They will understand their topic better and they will in turn contribute to a fuller portrait of that most wondrous of sociological animals, the penal state. Thank you. May I introduce Professor Nicola Lacey? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about this, Louis. <laughs> I'm going through a lot more of your. Um, can I just start by thanking, not only thanking Loïc for that uh, wonderful lecture, but also for thanking Fran and her editorial colleagues for this very nice invitation. Um, I've been reading Loïc's work for a long time. I've learned a great deal from it. Funnily enough, we only just met about 10 days ago at a workshop, uh, but I was just delighted to be able to, to accept this invitation. I should apologise both to Loïc and to you in the sense that um, I'm also speaking as several people uh, to here tonight are at a, um, a symposium at Queen Mary tomorrow on Loewig's uh, new book. And I think in the uh, rather um, intense period of preparation, where I had both the book to read and the PowerPoint slides were a very pleasant distraction, and the summary of the lecture, I, uh, they're, they're all sort of compacted in my mind, so some of my comments really relate as much to the book as to the lecture. Now, um, I'm in the unfortunate position that Loic and I agree about really an awful <laughs> lot. Um, and in particular, actually, we agree about the main theme of his lecture tonight, and that is the importance of integrating penality with other aspects of social and political analysis, not just in sociology, but also in political science. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been working with uh, literature and comparative political economy and I was just absolutely amazed when I started to review this literature how little political scientists have to say about punishment um, and I think Loic is absolutely right to press on this issue uh, across really the social sciences. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea to see uh, pr the prison as part of state building uh, across the history of modern states. Um, we're agreed that there needs to be a sort of political, economic, a material, as well as a cultural analysis. And we both think that the, um, 
a recognition of the role of, of policing and punishment in, to use Beckett and Weston's term, governing social marginality is, is a key issue. But I'm kind of imagining that Fran and her colleagues didn't invite me to stand up here tonight and agree with Illyric. So in what follows, I'm going to focus on the things on which I've got reservations about his position. And in particular, really to just give you the headline, I'm going to draw on historical arguments and particularly on comparative arguments to question whether Loic's conception of the penal state is adequately differentiated for the purposes of building the kind of explanatory account which he proposes about whether neoliberalism has, at a material level, the global influence which he ascribes to it, and about whether, hence, the process of penal Americanization, which he asserts in some of his recent writings, is really credible. Now, I'm just going to preface this with a little historical point. Um, notwithstanding the form of this building and the name of this lecture theatre, this is really a great place to be standing to talk about urban marginality over history because a couple of hundred years ago, this bit of London was the centre of the, what was then seen certainly by the establishment as the urban underworld. And you can get um, wonderful little vignettes of this in the, in, the, in the literary fiction of the period, um, notably, of course, in Charles Dickens' work, but also in some of the 18th century novels. Then, of course, the Victorian state came in with its great urban sweep to try successively in various ways to get rid of what they thought of as the residuum. Um, this is beautifully and famously recounted, distressingly, in Gareth Steadman Jones' marvellous book, Outcast London. Um, and I really want to ask, is this, uh, what does this tell us about um, really what neoliberalism has to do with it? Um, I'm also thinking here of Jeff Pearson's marvellous book, Hooligan, A History of Respectable Fears, which um, recounts really marvellously the successive waves of sort of what Stan's taught us to think of as moral panics about uh, very often urban... Uh, marginality and the disorder and insecurity which it is thought to generate uh, over the course of modern and pre-modern English history. Um, then more recently, Stuart Hall and his colleagues, Policing the Crisis, 1978. All these works pick up on many of the themes of Lo that Loic has been pushing to us this evening, but they all predate what he analyzes as neoliberalism. Um, of course, the forms which penality took in these various periods were, were very different, but their targets were actually remarkably similar. Um, so, you know, to put it very crudely, what really has neoliberalism got to do with it? So I, I have three main questions, and the first one is this. Is there one thing called the penal state? Now, um, in Loic's recent work, he's been very careful, and quite rightly so, to distance himself from what he sees as a sort of unduly generalised monolithic theories, which ascribe the recent intensification of law and order politics in many countries to post or late modern conditions, to risk society, to the birth of an exclusive society. But is his account, account of the global sway of neoliberalism really any more sensitive to the specific dynamics of particular states? Now, my first worry about this is that although the restructuring of the state and the changing balance, so I really like this metaphor, uh, between its masculine, macho right hand and its feminine, nice, welfareist left hand are absolutely central to Loewick's argument, he gives us, I think, a relatively abstract account of just how, at the level of key institutions, the American shift from welfare to workfare and the creation of prison, uh, work fare and the creation of prison fare were really brought about. So if you think back to that very nice uh, sort of flow chart that he had of the various dynamics, which I've, I've you know, definitely resonates with me. It is at an abstract level and not really at an institutional level. And part of what I would really like is a sort of institutional version of that diagram. Now, of course, states are 
complex entities uh, and their component institutions are peopled by actors with distinctive interests, working with, within distinctive incentive structures, which are themselves in turn shaped by those institutions, all perfectly you know, consistent with the Bourdieu bureaucratic field uh, approach. And recent work in both comparative criminology and comparative politics, however, shows conclusively that at this institutional level, different states work in very different ways. For example, as Lowy himself has acknowledged, Esping Anderson's important work on welfare states shows that there are three quite different regimes of what he calls welfare capitalism across the developed world. All of them with distinctive structures of entitlement and articulated, what's more, in strikingly different ways with other features of political economy. The neoliberal move to workfare is typical of only one of these three regimes. And notwithstanding some recent pressure on the more generous welfare regimes of the corpus corporatist countries of Northern Europe and the social democratic regimes of the Nordic countries, there's every reason to think that these differences will persist over the time, with important implications, I think, for punishment, among other things. Now, welfare states are actually the one institution of political economy which have found a consistent place in criminological analysis. But welfare state regimes, of course, are not the only systematic institutional difference among advanced economies. As the varieties of capitalism literature has shown, production regimes, labor markets, are also systematically different in institutional terms, implying, crucially for Loic's argument, different levels of vulnerability to the collapse of Fordist production. And also, of key importance for Loic's argument, very different constraints on the sway of the market, very different levels of influence for financial capitalism, very different levels of pressure for flexibilization of the labor market. So Loic's ruling class, that I'm quoting here from, from one of his recent papers, ruling class response to global economic conditions geared to, I quote again, um, a new economic regime based on capital hypermobility and labor flexibility, has in fact been very unevenly distributed across the globe with the more highly coordinated market economies of Northern Europe and Scandinavia far less influenced by neoliberalism than is the case of the liberal market economies of this country, of Australia, or particularly of the United States. Finally, and in my view possibly the key omission in contemporary criminology, the organization of political systems varies very widely. And this, I think, makes a decisive difference to the ways in which perceived anxiety about crime and insecurity, the sociological factors that, to which Loic was rightly drawing attention, register in the electoral system. In a nutshell, in long-established proportional representation systems, there are more checks and balances. There's also more coordination and bargaining between the settled interests who are represented in, in the party system, as compared, that is, with first-past-the-post majoritarian systems like the one that we have in this country. In these uh, majoritarian systems, um, an adversarial and uh, individualistic political culture, along with declining partisanship, has fostered the volatility of law and order politics amid the unedifying scramble for the support of the median voter. Given the extraordinary diffusion of electoral politics in America, right down to roles that are very close to the delivery of criminal justice, prosecutors, for example, judges, this seems a particularly important factor in explaining the recent history of American penality. 
So just to sum up that point, if we're to assess the plausibility of Loewig's argument, I think we need to know more at an institutional level about how hyperincarceration was affected in America, so as to be able to assess whether what he calls neoliberalism is likely to have, or where neoliberalism is likely to be having most influence. So secondly, and moving on, I want to say something a, a little bit more specific about what a comparative, uh, a look at the comparative data might tell us about Loewig's thesis. Now, um, Loewig has distinguished among um, contemporary criminologists by being very careful in his work to give examples from a whole range of countries. Um, and he acknowledges uh, in his recent work that the social democratic countries of Northern Europe and Scandinavia don't exhibit the same kind of hyper incarceration which has characterized the US nor even the significant increases which have unfortunately been seen in this country. He gives particular emphasis to France, a country which of course he knows a great deal about and on which I'm certainly not going to risk questioning his analysis. But it does seem to me that he gives very mixed messages about the comparative reach of his argument. On the one hand, he acknowledges differences and, for example, makes, I think, the very interesting suggestion that the accentuation of penal control in European countries has focused more on surveillance and policing than on imprisonment, so a suggestion which certainly chimes with knowing that here in Britain we are, unfortunately, the, we have the demerit of being the CCTV capital of the world. But on the other hand, he also refers to things like a global firestorm of law and order. And he argues in his most recent book that the US carceral archipelago shows us the possible, nay probable, contours of the future landscape of the police, justice, and prison in European and Latin American countries that have embarked on, embarked on the path of liberating the economy. <coughs> Now that at least introduces a qualification, recognizes that not all European countries have moved in that neoliberal American direction. But he isn't always so cautious. This evening he referred in discussing some of his charts to everywhere. And another quotation, who can say today where and when the ballooning of the jails and penitentiaries visible in nearly all the European countries will stop? Now, I want to just look at a few more charts, and uh, I'm afraid that the difference between my charts and Loic's is going to make put you all in mind of that old joke about lies, damn lies, and statistics. Of course, it makes a big difference how you present these figures, but also it makes a big difference what time span you look at. So here to start with, I just couldn't resist putting this one in because... Um, it allows me to make my usual joke about America being up in the corner of shame. And as it happens, although I prepared this chart well before I read your book, it's appropriately up on the right-hand corner of the chart. <laughs> so um, the key thing to notice about this table, which shows imprisonment rates per 100,000 for a whole number of countries, is that the table would have to be three times its current height in order to accommodate the current American imprisonment rate. So first thing I want you to notice is just how absolutely extraordinary American imprisonment rates are. Next though, here and in my next figure, notice that there are pretty significant differences among European states. And this becomes clearer if we go there. increase in punishment, in imprisonment rate over the last few years, notably by our colleague here, David Downs. But actually, um, the Netherlands' latest rate is 100. It's, it's still much, much higher than it used to be, but it isn't as outrageously high as it looks in this chart. And there seems to have been some issue about uh, the actual basis on which the <laughs> figures were calculated. But finally, and most importantly, I just want you to have a look at a, a chart that shows you development over time. 
And when you look back over a whole half century, it, the, this pattern looks really very different. It looks less dystopian. And here, finally, are some very crude projections. That's just based on what's been happening over the last six years, which is, after all, a period in which all of Loewig's inflationary neoliberal forces have been underway. Now, obviously, as Loewig himself said, imprisonment rates are just one measure, and they're a pretty crude one. But nonetheless, this, this doesn't look to me like the rest of the world being in a sort of free fall towards American uh, neoliberal hyper-incarceration. Even in this country, whose record prison population is, Loic and I both agree, <coughs> hugely unfortunate, it really doesn't look like global penal inflation. So my suggestion really is that as much as, and perhaps even more than David Garland's famous account of a, a culture of control rooted in late modernity, Loewig's story of creeping global neoliberalism seems to me to risk projecting an essentially American story onto the whole planet. <laughs> now, finally and thirdly, um, Loewig, of course, has an answer to this. <laughs> Let me point out before he gets up and says <laughs> what the answer is. Um, it's basically this, and I, I quote here from the postscript to <laughs> Prisons of Poverty, in which he describes his theory as an oblique contribution to research on the globalization of crime and justice on the punishment side, but one that goes against the grain of globalization studies insofar as it insists that what appears as a blind and benign drift towards planetary convergence, putatively fostered by the technological and cultural unification of world policy, is actually a stratified process of this is his emphasis, differentiated and diffracted Americanization, fostered by the strategic activities of hierarchical networks of state managers, ideological entrepreneurs, and scholarly marketers in the United States and in countries of reception. Now, the importance of that sort of diffusion of ideas from America in his account makes me particularly anxious to have that more institutional elabor elaboration that we were talking about earlier. But in its absence and in his latest book, most of his very detailed discussion of this sort of policy transfer um, focuses on the French case. And in his discussion of the French case, he talks a lot about political, political culture, what ministers are putting up on their websites, um, publications, communications, policy names, and, and, and so on. I would like to know more, to be honest, about what is actually happening on the ground and what the big pattern looks like. Um, I, you know, call me a sort of simple-minded, quantitative kind of person. I'm not even a social scientist, actually, I'm a lawyer. But I, I, I'm a bit skeptical, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to illustrate why with, with an anecdote. Um, it actually has to do with uh, uh, an ESRC funded project I did about 15 years ago with my friend and colleague Lucia Zedner, who you <coughs> mentioned, which was on Communale Criminelle Prevention in Germany, uh, which was a really classic example of something that was a kind of policy transfer amid these sort of transnational networks of communication that Loewig is focusing on in part um, from this country. Uh, policy of community crime prevention and community policing. And we thought this was a really interesting analogy and we got a grant to go off and study it and uh, we started of course by uh, getting all the literature from various regions in Germany and it was obviously really big news in a whole number of, not all regions but in some of the lands. And so then we went off to do our field work. And when we started to do the field work, we realized that although there were endless brochures and policies called communal criminal, communal criminal prevention, there was actually very little of it happening. And that has always given me a bit of a, a you know, sort of hesitation about how far this sort of really alarming noise that you get about um, 
you know, some of the nastier, from my point of view, and most expensive and ineffective and anti-civil libertarian developments in the States getting over to Europe. I really wonder how much they're actually happening on the ground. I mean, I don't think we have anything like zero policing in this country, despite the fact that if you looked on the Home Office website, you might think that we did. So with that anecdote, let me just conclude by saying, of course, these comments are primarily intended as a provocation to further analysis and exchange. And I thank you, Loic, for the provocation. And I look forward to the exchange. I'm going to prevent Loic from making an immediate response. He will have um, various opportunities, including in the special issue which the journal will publish based on the uh, lecture tonight and a number of respondents and indeed a counter response by our guest speaker. But perhaps I could take um, a couple of questions from the floor. We have a short amount of time left, which might also provide an occasion for Loic to respond to some of the points raised in Nicola Lacey's. Uh, comments. There's a mic just coming down behind you. The gentleman, oh, he's which he's just getting. Working. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Clark from the Open University. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you very much because I thought that was wonderful, and I share the ambition to extend and enrich the analysis of the state. And in that spirit, may I ask two questions, sneakily? Yeah. Short ones. Short ones. The first is the problem of the anthropomorphic metaphor of the state. Okay. Why do we think that states only have two hands? <laughs> My okay. suspicion is that states have many more hands, and I have a colleague who thinks of the state as an octopus, that it is tentacular, not two-handed and we might need to think about the wider repertoire of strategies that states exchange, rebalance, and play with. The second is, please say a little more uh, about what you said at the beginning about the contradictions and the disjunctures and the gaps and the slippages because they slipped. And I'd like to know more about the contestations that they might make possible. But thank you both very much. All social theory is a, is a is a fiction. That is, it's a fabrication where we compress information and simplify so that we can read the world. And and um, to think of the state of having two hands is already a progress relative to thinking of it as, as a monolith. And it provides an orienting device for reconnecting these two sides of what I, I take to be two sides of poverty policy. You know, uh, and, and already, in a sense, uh, forcing scholars of welfare and poverty to take in the criminal justice system. That's already a huge enterprise. I'm right now you know, battling uh, you know, with uh, a journal of social service administration in the US that wants to do a special issue. But half of the scholar on the editorial board think this is totally out of our league. We, we have no business. This is not, we're not a journal of criminology. Since they want to stick to the established division of labor, people who study welfare study welfare. They don't have to worry about penal policy. People who study you know, criminologists worry about crime and punishment, but they don't have to worry about social policy. And so already, it's a big enough task to reconnect those two uh, that I think if I came uh, with a metaphor of the, of the octopus with 29 uh, tentacles, then uh, you know I'd, I'd lose people. Um, uh, but and you know and, and, in, and in Bourdieu's analysis of neoliberalism, in fact, you know, it's it's these two hands. He starts with these two hands and gives us this schema, and I think it, we can develop it further. In fact, I think in my own work, I mean now as I was writing up this lecture, actually I was thinking that I am criminally responsible for neglecting public health, and I think public health is such an important uh, part of you know, particularly uh, the life of the lower class. I mean, access to decent health services, your life expectancy, after all, that's, you know, Armatia Sen taught us that, that, you know, 
if we, if you want to <laughs> measure the greatest inequality is how many years you live. And when we see in contemporary societies continuing enormous disparities across the class spectrum, uh, you know, in life expectancy, uh, you know, I think that we need to bring public health as, you know, as one of the ways in which we can treat undesirable and problematic conditions. You know, I argue in the beginning of punishing the poor, you have the social treatment, you have the penal treatment, and you have the medical treatment. There are the two, two ways in which the state can respond to many conditions, such as homelessness or drug addiction. Uh, and I think I, I slide, but, but, but I'll make a plea for let's start with two, and let's see how, you know, how much mileage we can get. Let, let, let's see if we manage to get people who study welfare to take in you know, the penal system and, and, and vice versa. And I think if we do that already, we will have made great progress. Then we can introduce a third, a fourth, a fifth, and so on. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested actually in the way in which you phrase it, the, anthrop the anthropomorphism. It's a real danger. Because, and, and I see actually, that the, for me, the great virtue of the notion of bureaucratic field is that precisely it does not treat the state as a unified entity. It treats it, 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 treat, it, it, its relative degree of internal integration and coherence as a variable. It's a variable that depends on the social struggles that have created different kinds of states that are more or less coherent, more or less fragmented, more or less integrated, in which there is one sector or another sector that dominates or does not dominate, or there's a stalemate, or there are certain social problems that belong to certain sectors of the state and shall not be touched by others. And, and, and to me, the notion of bureaucratic field makes it possible to look at the state as an internal battleground, where the definition of what conditions mandate the interventions of the authority and with what arm of the state, one of the 29, you know, is in a sense, it's up for grabs. It's up for grabs not only in the society at large, but it's, it's, it's up for grabs between the social forces outside the state in direction to the state, but also it's up for grabs inside the state. And, in a sense, and it's, it's a way of responding to, to, to your to your first question, the, the, the penal state, the penal state is not you know, by itself neoliberal. The penal state can be anything. Uh, you know, it's it's those you know, the preliminary definition of you know, you say the police, the courts, the prison system. Those institutions officially entrusted with enforcing you know law and order, which actually can then seep into if you ask your 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 educational system. Actually, the French state just this week created special units of teachers. And they are proud to say they are teachers who are special security units that will travel between high schools and try to prevent attacks and battles by gangs or battles by groups of youth. From, and it's, a, it's inside of the educational, uh, it's, it's inside of the left hand of the state. So it's the entry of the panoptic and punitive logic inside of the left hand of the state. And what's really, really remarkable, so they, they get teachers to volunteer to be members of this special Policing units. You know, um, uh, two months ago, the French state also proposed to create special, this time, police units that will fly around the country to go and check the handbags of the children to make sure that they do not bring weapons, because there was one incident you know, of a, a kid bringing a weapon inside of high school. And so, so, the, so there's this, but, but, but in a sense, whose, whose problem is it? First, should the state intervene? There's a battle outside of the bureaucratic towards the, but also inside of the bureaucratic field. Is it a problem for psychologists to handle? Is it a problem for pedagogists, teachers to handle? Is it a problem for the police to handle? Is it a problem for a social worker? And, and the notion of a bureaucratic field allows you to make that an empirical question, rather than, in a sense, uh, presuppose that oh, this is the province of, well, why? You know, in some society, it is the province of the, of the police. 20, 15 years ago, even when I published in France, Prisons of Poverty in 1999, it was unthinkable to have a, a, a high school um, superintendent call the police to resolve a battle between students you know, in, the, in the yard. Now it has become routine practice. It has become routine practice. And indeed, there's even a program where the superintendents are required now by their official administration to call the police. Um, so, and that's what, it's a battle inside of the bureaucratic field. Um, so the penal state is a sector of the bureaucratic field that may be large or small, that may grow or may recede, that may be intrusive or that may be intrusive, depending on the balance of power between the different sectors of the bureaucratic field. Then you can take the, the nice thing about the notion of field, it's like a, a lens that you can take at different levels. 
So you can look at the bureaucratic field in total, map its structure and its functioning, and then you can look at the notion of field and look at the penal sector of the bureaucratic field as a field. And you look, at, look in particular at the battle between the police, the, the judges, and the correctional administration. And you can make, in a sense, the degree of coherence, the degree of coordination, one of the key variables, actually. One of the things that determines the US to have hyper-incarceration is that it doesn't have a criminal justice system because it's not a system, because there's no integration. It's a, it's, a, it's a hodgepodge of tens of thousands of bureaucracies that have no oversight, no overarching authority, no systems of communication and feedback, such that the police is run by the city, the jail is run by the county, the prison is run by the state, and the whole policy is determined by the federal government through a complicated system of incentives that tries to nationalize penal policy but doesn't doesn't manage to do so. So the notion of bureaucratic field uh, allows us to, to, to avoid the anthropomorphic uh, representation of the state as a unified actor that has coherence and that has certain you know, sort of universal properties. Um, now, penalization as a, as a strategy that has a multiplicity of forms, and when I, when, when, when I mention um, you know, when I use incarceration rate as the indicator of the return of the penal state, you know, I, I add immediately um, penalization actually takes a plurality of forms that could be activating the police, uh, citing a, a special riot police squads in the, quote, problem districts, the sink estates of the urban periphery, which has been the policy. So this does not necessarily translate, now it does translate into higher incarceration in the short run, which you can then disgorge through a whole other series of measures, such as 14th of July mercies by the president who releases discreetly 15,000 inmates so that you keep, you know, you, you keep the, your carceral inflation under control. But you're, the rolling out of the penal state has taken the form of intensive policing, such that the young men from these derelict neighborhoods get, get asked their identity papers four or five times a day, have very virulent relationships with the police that, that bursts in, in, in riots periodically, such as we saw in November 2005, sometimes very spectacularly, sometimes for weeks. These riots themselves serve to justify the further rolling out of measures of penalization. Um, you can have, there's a beautiful book that just came out in France on the transmission of assistance of youth in danger, that is child protective services that shows that the number of children referred to judicial authorities has doubled in the last 15 years. And it's what, it's inside of the bureaucratic field, a transmission of the relation of power between the child protective services, the magistrates, the local courts, and the welfare services. And so it's not even a transmission of, in a sense, social movements, uh, attacking the state, no, it's an internal transformation of the state. And this is where we must get, and I agree with you, we must get into the nuts and bolts of the actual functioning of concrete bureaucratic fields, understand their, their topology, map their topology, their functioning, their internal contradictions, the rules, the fact that allow, for instance, in Austria to have an extraordinary discourse of zero tolerance policing, and the police will not act on it. They will talk, you know, so they will bark loud, but there will be no bite. Why? Because the, the police in the you know, inheritance of the Prussian era, uh, you know, the police is extraordinarily autonomous, is extraordinarily capable of protecting its own province, its own way of functioning, its own prerogative. It doesn't want any indicators of performance as the politicians want. And, and then it is able, inside of the state apparatus, if you wish, or inside the bureaucratic field, to stop those demands cold. And so you see the political system sort of spewing out, you know, the rhetoric of zero tolerance, but inside the bureaucratic field is such that it will not go, it, it will not actually change dramatically policing strategies. And if it doesn't change dramatically policing strategies, then it has limited impact on incarceration rates. Thus we see Austria as one of the countries that has resisted uh, the, the, the rise of incarceration. So can, the, can we take one yeah. further question, and a f further brief question here in the middle, and maybe even a brief answer yes. before we take a yes. drink? Yeah. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for your lecture um, and for um, the comment in response. My name is Liliana Pop. I'm a political scientist. Um, I guess um, uh, my question points to what might be happening uh, within uh, the difference within the bureaucratic field and in the relationship between the different sections of the field. Um, when you characterize 
the neoliberal state as a penal state, as, as I thought was the gist of your argument. I see it's more uh, complex than that. An another thing that um, uh, somehow in, in the last year we've discovered with um, 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 uh, astonishment, I guess, because of the financial crisis. Um, another thing that the neoliberal state has been doing um, is uh, within the its political economy dimension, if you like, um, is a kind of, of uh, financialization mm -hmm. um, through which act, it has actually sought to um, draw into its own logic um, larger and, and, and larger sections of, of the various um, polities. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a way, um, uh, creating the basis for it, uh, for the crisis that we have uh, uh, for the, uh, for that we have now. So the the logic that that you Sorry, could suggest. Sorry, I ask you to frame it as a question? Yes. Okay. So the logic you suggest um, for the the penal state seems to be in some tension. Um, with um, the, the logic of further and further inclusion and the, the relaxation of, of uh, requirements for the extension of credit and, and things like that. So in, in, would, would this affect in some way your understanding of, of the neoliberal state and, and to what extent that is a penal state as well? Okay, my argument is not that the, the neoliberal state is a penal state, but rather that neoliberalism, to the degree that it's applied, and various countries have various capacity. I mean, neo, neoliberalism is not a thing, in a sense. It's a political project. And so, and it's a transnational project from, from its very beginning. And it travels across borders, but it meets borders that have higher or lesser capacities for stopping it. And so it impacts differentially different countries, and different sectors of the state differently. And what I argue is that neoliberalism requires the building of a different kind of state. And the ideology of neoliberalism is that it brings about small government, the shrinking of the state, the disappearance of the state. Or, and my argument is that actually existing neoliberalism is not that. In fact, the, the original state in which neoliberalism was started is Chile. And what is remarkable is Chile, under, under the dictatorship, uh, you know, for political reasons, but also for reasons that have to do with control of the social order, became the leading incarcerator of Latin America. England was the, the Britain was the Trojan horse of the neoliberal project on the European continent. It also became the leading incarcerator uh, in Western Europe. And so to the degree that countries pursue that project, then they build a state that has these four elements, that to the degree that you deregulate your market, and particularly the the low wage labor market, you create social insecurity. Since you can't manage social insecurity by rolling out your welfare state or else people won't accept insecure employment, you, you double down on your social insecurity, then you have to do something. You have to curb the social disorders that you have created at the bottom of the class structure. And the only way that you can do that is by rolling out your penal state. And in sense, it's not, it's not that there's a, there's a set doctrine, there's a manual that people buy the manual of building your neoliberal state. You know, that on page, you know, on chapter three, you get to, you know, build your prison. But in a sense, it, it's a dilemma that state elites encounter as they see, you know, as on the one side, they have to curb the disorders that they created at the bottom of the class structure. And on the other side, and it's an important part of the argument, they face a deficit of legitimacy. And they, they have to deliver something to their, their electorate. And paradoxically, to their lower class electorate. Um, and it's, in a sense, it's the viciousness of it, is that you propose law and order policies to that sector of the population that will be the target of those law and order policies. Um, so, so uh, now on the on the question of the there's a there's there's a debate on on an article that I wrote called "Crafting the Neoliberal State," coming out in Theoretical Criminology at the end of the year, in which John Campbell has a beautiful article where he argues, well, not only is right for the lower class, but what he forgets is for the middle class, the debtor state. That is, the neoliberal state said, you know, laissez faire and laissez passer at the top. You regulate yourself, you do what you want. But for the middle class, the, the neoliberal state provides the ability to participate in consumption and competition through debt. And we're seeing the results today. And then at the bottom, through regulation through the penal state. So he adds that dimension. See, for me, I'm really concerned about 
the, I'm really concerned about how the neoliberal state relates to the lower class and to the formation of the precariat and to the formation of the post-industrial lower class. I don't, I don't uh, uh, propose a sort of a generic theory, you know, and I, and, I, and I chide the students of neoliberalism for having totally forgotten that, you know, that, uh, that neoliberalism doesn't come with a, with a small state. So, they, he, so it's, it's an oblique response to your questions. Neoliberalization is a political project. It succeeds or it fails depending on how, in particular, the bureaucratic field operates. Um, and, and, and depending on the position of the bureaucratic field in the field of power. And Bourdieu gives us three concepts that here we would need to roll out. One is the political field, the other is the field of power, and the third is the bureaucratic field. The, the, bureaucratic, the position of the bureaucratic field, the state changes in the field of power in relation to the economic field um, in, in particular. So as states become weakened in front of capital, they change their internal structure. And as the internal structure of the bureaucratic field changes, then the possibilities for penalization as a policy increase. So you have these three levels of analysis, and then the political field is yet another entity that overlaps in part with the bureaucratic field, but is not confounded to it. So you need to roll out these three concepts to understand um, the ways in which the bureaucratic field will act as a break, or on the contrary, will, will in a sense be already oriented towards the, the neoliberal transformation of the state. Now, on the question of Americanization, you noticed I, I didn't, my claim is not Europe, in fact, I make the opposite claim. In, in Punishing the Poor, I argue that there are a multiplicity of roads to the penal state. You know, there's penalization as a state strategy for managing marginality, and it takes a variety of forms. There's a variety of capitalisms, and there's a variety of forms of neoliberalism, neoliberalization. So if you combine the two, it gives you diversities of capitalism, diversities of paths of entry of neoliberalization, and diversities of forms of penalization. But I think we can understand these three with the same set of concepts. And no, there isn't one penal state, you know, universally realized empirically, but we can construct one concept of penal state and then realize and then understand empirically how it comes to be manifested under different phenomenal forms as varieties of capitalism, varieties of paths of neoliberalizations and forms of neoliberalizations, and variety of penalizations combined. Will that lead to Americanization? Well, sociologists are not in the business of predicting, at least I'm not, in the business of predicting the past. I think social scientists should stick to retrodiction, to predicting what happened you know, in the recent history, in the last 30 years. But, but let's say that, I, in a sense, I agree with you, no, we, we will not see in Western Europe levels of incarceration typical that the US has reached, you know, 700 per, 750 per 100 residents, for a whole reasons that have to do with the shape of the society, the political tradition, and so on and so forth. Um, the reasons why the US has this are, in particular, the particular fragmented bureaucratic field with which it operates. That has to do with the extreme degradation of labor, which is itself a reflection of the, of the uh, fragmentation of the bureaucratic field that has not uh, been there, the state has not been there as a protector of the working class, in particular because it's a highly decentralized, fragmented, it's a system of parties and courts and so on and so forth, because of the moralism that dominates politics and because of racial division. Racial division and, and spatial segregation, both on class and race, act as levers that intensify the ability to uh, to pinpoint your penal state towards certain population to the degree that the average citizen doesn't identify with the target of penalization, and to the degree that penalization is targeted at the black lower class, then the average citizen doesn't think it's a bad thing and, and doesn't react. It's not going to happen on that scale in Western Europe, but at the same time. And this is where I said, what were the expectations 25 years ago of where the prisons were going? That it was going down the tubes. And it has gone, not gone down the tubes. And in a sense, for the Netherlands, yes, they, in a sense, they only have 150 inmates per 100,000 compared to the US 750. Yes, but 150, that's five times what they had 20 years ago. And in a sense, 150 in the Netherlands, it is hyper-incarceration on the scale of the Netherlands, given their history, their tradition, and their tolerance for, you know, for, for the use of custodial, uh, for the use of custodial um, institutions. So I, I, you know, 
is that we, we, have, we have different, we, we converge very much in our analysis, but we have different objects that we want to explain. You want to explain why do we continue to see these remarkable differences in incarceration? And I'm interested in the trend. Why do we see this common trend towards higher incarceration nearly everywhere with, I mentioned, the, the, the exceptions of Canada, uh, Germany, um, Austria, Finland, and Denmark, although Denmark recently... Now, Denmark is a very interesting case. I think we're going to have to continue <laughs> the Denmark case um, over drinks, which everyone is absolutely burning to hear about. Um, uh, and apologies to those of you who weren't able to pose their question now, but we do have an opportunity for further discussion with drinks, which I understand will be served directly outside the lecture theatre. Before we, um, we move to the bar, may I ask you again to thank our speakers tonight, Loïc Lacan and Lydia Lassie.